Hello, BookTube. I recently put out a call for questions for a 6K Q&A. Not 6K subscribers, but 6,000 videos which have appeared on this channel. And once again, you did not disappoint. I got tons and tons of questions, so we're going to go through these. I uh, will do them in blocks of 30 minutes each till we get to the end, roughly, thereabouts. And uh, I ported these questions over from the comment section of that video into a document so I could clean up all the extra stuff that YouTube adds, and also the, there were some cartoons that some of you added. Those had to be cleared up as well, uh, just so that I don't get distracted while I'm reading them. So if I if I omit a question, if I omit your question, uh, just we'll do another Q&A. Just feel free to ask it again. Uh, so let's start off with uh, part number one. And we start off right away with Read by Fred, whose channel you should subscribe to. Uh, my question is, which fiction and which nonfiction works were so humorously written that you laughed out loud throughout the book? Not a one. Uh, it's very rare for me to laugh out loud in a, a work of fiction or nonfiction anyway. And more and often than not, because of the South Boston Irish Catholic thing, I tend to laugh grimly, so not out of amusement. <laughs> uh, the last thing that made me laugh hysterically out loud was probably Spy Magazine from the 1980s here in America, which has never been reprinted. There's no, as far as I know, there's no spy anthology of any kind, and it wouldn't even if you did an anthology like that, a big fat anthology of what they did, it it wouldn't capture the weird, wild moment of the magazine. But even then, I'm willing to admit that probably the moment was the thing that did it and not the writing. Uh, Ready Readet. Ready Readet. Hi, Steve. I have a list of questions. Number one, how has your life changed over the time span of you making the last 6,000 videos? What a great question. Uh, it's changed in a lot of ways. I mean, it's changed outwardly, just objectively, in that, for instance, when I started making my videos, I still had my old dogs. I, I still had my girls, my pointer and my basset hound, who were the focus of my whole life and uh, were getting slower and slower, older and older. And then while I was making videos every day or every other day, uh, it's only recently, I should I should stress, it's only recently that, that I have quietly acceded to how spoiled you people are by making five videos a day. Nobody else on this platform makes five videos a day. But slowly but surely, as those videos were going on, my girls were getting slower and weaker, and then finally they became sick. And that takes a long time. It took a long time with both of them, and it happened in tandem with both of them. And I don't know. Some of you have said that that is visible in those videos. The strain of that on me is visible in those videos. And some of you say that it's not. But that's definitely a change. Also, of course, my, my professional life has continued to shift and change, as it does if you're, if you're a freelance writer. Uh, but then there's also the, the BookTube-related ways, which is that in the, the span of making those 6,000 videos, I have made a lot of friends. I've made all my imaginary BookTube friends. And some of those imaginary BookTube friends have stepped through the wardrobe into my reality and actually come here at Hyde Cottage for Wine and Kells Homes to meet my dogs. Some of you met, came here and met my girls a long, long time ago. It's been going on for a long time, and I really like it. I wholeheartedly encourage it. Uh, this is not your usual parasocial relationship. Other YouTubers, or even some, God forbid, high-profile booktubers, may say, you know, guys, 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 I love hearing from you, uh, but they would call in a SWAT team or have their team of lawyers sue you if you even approached them on the street. I'm not like that. I mean it. I absolutely mean it. You are free to voxer me at any time, the day or night, free to email me on any subject, and I also want you all to come and visit. We are all multiple vaxxed. We are as protected by a pandemic as we possibly can be. I want you all to come and visit. I would like it if I had a visitor every weekend. Uh, but you had more questions, yes? If you were to take time away from books in order to learn yet another language, what language would you like to learn now? All right, well, I wouldn't take time away from books to do that. I had no reason to do that, but it would, it would be Japanese. Without a shadow of a doubt, it would be Japanese. Uh, and finally, do you celebrate dogs' birthdays or give dogs gifts on any holidays? No, I don't. Nope. Uh, I treat my dogs fairly well, 365 days a year. It's one of the reasons why is because these weird uh, observances, anniversaries and birthdays like that have always been a little bit elusive to me. I never really keep them in mind. So it, much like with, with to avoid the stress of getting that one perfect gift for that one perfect person at Christmas or on birthdays, 
I try to make a point of being generous all year long to everybody. If I have something somebody wants and I don't want it, or even if I do want it, but I don't want it as much as I do, I just give it to them. To try and take the pressure off things, days like that. And dogs don't have any experience of that at all. No awareness of it whatsoever. I try to make my dog's lives really good all the time. So that I try to fill it with surprises and happiness all the time. I'm a lot more able to do that now that I don't have to clock in someplace far away from here. One heartbreak that I had for 25 years was that I had to leave my dogs in the morning first thing or in the afternoon at an arbitrary time when we could be enjoying ourselves and when they, they were old enough so that they didn't want me to leave. I'm glad I don't have to do that anymore. Uh, let's see here. Candace Yuri says, happy 6,000 videos, Steve. Thank you so much for bringing me back Q&A. Here's my question. A few library tours ago, 2019 maybe, you wished that the biography section of Hyde Cottage was bigger even if that meant taking existing shelf space from other categories. Has your library changed in recent years, if at all? It has changed, yes. The, bi the, bi the biography shelves have not increased. They badly, badly need it, but they haven't done so. I added one extra floor-to-ceiling bookcase, and it is hugely overcrowded. And it's also not contiguous with the other biography bookshelf, which is bothering me. That That's just enough to bother me. And then I have... I have two non-contiguous huge bookcases, and then I have one whole wall of floor-ceiling bookcases. And the whole wall is being taken over, but not by biography. It's being taken over by books about books, collections of reviews and essays and whatnot. That section has grown enormously. It outgrew the, the bookcase that I had for it in the little book room. It spilled out here. I rationalized that by thinking, you know, I do a lot of work on the fainting couch out here, so I, it's, my whole life is not only in that little book room. Uh, it's a mess. My my print and paper physical book library right now is a mess, an absolute mess. It's things are scattered everywhere. Categories are not together. There's a huge amount of duplication. There's a huge amount of dross, and there's also e-reading, which I love and do an enormous amount of. I honestly think sometimes that what I ought to do is the, the way to deal with this is just a clean sweep. Go to each individual bookcase and say, look at the bookcase and say, all right, there's X number of books on this bookcase. I'm going to pull 90% of the books on this bookcase for sale to the Brattle Bookshop. 90% is the proportion that I'm going to reach, and I don't care how I get there. I, there will be some that I can keep, but 90% of them are going on every one of these bookcases. To, which would mean that I would be getting rid of 90% of my collection, and I really should. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, let's see here. Graveyard Shift. What was your favorite thing to teach in schools, or if you can't pick just one, a few if you can't pick just one, in terms of a discussion, a certain author, a book, anything? I hope I asked this in an answerable way. It is answerable, yes. And it has an answer, a hands-down answer, and that's writing. I love teaching writing. Absolutely love it. I don't really think that writing can be taught. Uh, not the the weird firings, not the, the great reaches of your imagination and where that jumps. But although 21st century writers don't know this and would deny it and also would sue you for saying it, that's not all there is to writing. <laughs> there are plenty of actual technical skills to writing. You have to learn the basics of characterization, the basics of uh, showing and not telling or telling and not showing, the basis of trusting your audience. You have to learn pacing and plotting and character and all that sort of thing. And I love teaching that. Absolutely love, I wouldn't even say that teaching is the right word. Coaching might be a little bit less top-down of a word. I absolutely love doing that. I love the experience on a student's face, no matter what age the student is, when they suddenly realize that they can do this. It opens up a whole universe to them, a universe in which you are God. That is no small attraction. I, I, unfortunately, the way society is set up, People just automatically think, well, you know, I'm, I read writers if I'm a reader, but I'm not a writer myself. I couldn't possibly write myself. That is absolutely not true. This is a learned thing, like any other skill. Any human can do it, and anyone can get good at it. I, so I, that was my favorite thing to do by far, especially to reach that moment. As, like with young people, when I, would, when I would be teaching them, and I would have some, some young kid, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old, maybe he's... Uh, a bit schlubby to look at. Maybe he has no self-confidence because of that. Uh, maybe he just feels put upon in his life. Like, my parents don't really agree with me. My grades aren't all that good. My future doesn't look all that bright. My social life is non-existent. 
maybe that that boy falls into video games because they're a great escape and they have a lot of volition you can make binary choices all throughout a video game the moment when that boy realizes that he can create a whole world and he can mirror people extract elements from people in the real world extract elements from things in the real world and work through them on the written page the the moment that he realizes not only that he can do that but that he can get better at it better and better at it and that it has nothing to do with you know whether or not you have good genetics to have a jawline or a hairline it has nothing to do with whether or not you are awkward when you talk to a romantic interest or a possible romantic interest it has nothing to do with pleasing the realistic or unrealistic expectations of your parents or anybody else it has nothing to do with any of that you are god when you are in that that capacity the moment when that boy sees that oh, oh. <laughs> I love that moment. I love getting anyone to reach that moment at any way, at any age. Uh, so that that's my favorite thing to do, which you'd think would mean I'd make more authortube videos, but I, I'll, I'll be getting to that. Uh, uh, let's see here. But we, we, anyway, we're, we're on to geocraftsmen. What do you think of it when writers choose to begin every chapter of their book with a quote? Does it really add anything? Uh, yeah, epigraphs can add can add a lot. I it doesn't it doesn't really do much for me in terms of the book itself like for instance not well non-fiction or fiction their writers tend to add them for an illegitimate reason which is to sort of direct you into how you should read what's coming next i am not interested in an author's opinion of how i should read what's coming next i don't want your directions seymour i don't want any of your insight you're just another reader once this thing is done you're just another reader and i'm a considerably better reader than you are so i'll tell you what your book means okay <laughs> but uh but I love it from just a magpie perspective, because a lot of these quotes are really good things, the, the things that I didn't know about that I can keep and use and think about myself, until you get to the 21st century when I, the few authors who manage to do that are quoting from their own Twitter feeds. So that, that's of no interest at all. Uh, let's see here. Tony Umbrella, Tommy Umbrella uh, says, thanks, Steve, for all the good recommendations over the years. I fear that this has already take, been asked, but Steve, what are your thoughts on software like ChatGPT? Especially, how will it change the literary world in the long run? Uh, well, I think it's fascinating. I don't know why. I, I seem to be under some sort of contractual obligation to be outraged and panicked by this. And I, for some reason, it hasn't produced that reaction in me. Maybe it's just that I don't understand it well enough. But I, I, for some reason, it has not produced outrage and panic. Uh, even though, I guess, technically, maybe it should. I mean, from what I understand, if programs like chat gpt they are entirely dependent on how much material you feed into them that is that entirely determines how good the material is that comes out the other end which means that uh, the more prolific you've been as an author especially in the public domain where you, someone can find these things without your knowledge and feed it into these these programs the more vulnerable you are which would make me pretty vulnerable it would make me among the most vulnerable writers in the english language and yet and yet <laughs> Uh, if you were, if somebody theoretically were to do that, take 10,000 reviews of mine, feed them into a chat, and then tell that chat program to write a Steve review of a new book, I'd be fascinated to see what would come out, what that would be. I, I guess maybe contractually I am supposed to be horrified by what would come out, but I'm fascinated. I would love to see that. For some reason, I don't feel threatened. And I am 100% convinced that I'm I won't, don't think I'll live long enough for the non-disclosure agreements to expire. I'm 100% convinced that I have already read published fiction that was written this way. 100% convinced. And, well, what do we think of that? I mean, let's say you have a really sort of flat programmatic author. Someone who's written a huge amount. It's not Turgenev. It's, it's not technically good. But it satisfies a vast reading public. So Daniel Steele or, you know, James Patterson. Take all the written works of someone like that. They're all in electronic files. I'm sure they would be easy to do. Feed all of James Patterson into a chatbot and have it write a James Patterson novel. Would the result be gibberish? Would it have huge gibberish parts to it so that you need a human editor to go through it line by line, which kind of defeats the point? And if it doesn't, if it is clean prose, well then won't it satisfy a James Patterson reader? And would a James Patterson reader really care all that much if they learned that it was a, a chatbot that did this? 
amalgamating James Patterson instead of Patterson himself? I, I know that James Patterson would care. I can see why he would care, but I don't know. My my position in the, the Republic of Letters has always been as a watchdog for you. Uh, unlike a lot of my critical brethren, I am not putting on airs myself. I'm As a watchdog for you, I want to find the things out there that are really good that I can recommend to you that you will really like, and also to warn you away from the things that are really bad, that will waste your time, especially hiding the fact that they will waste your time until it's too late. And I don't see how that those imperatives change with chat GPT or anything like it. I, I guess we'll have to wait and see. We should revisit this question in a year. I imagine that what, that what we can learn about what this thing will do to the Republic of Letters will be far clearer in a year. Uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, sorry, these answers are going along. Well, we'll just keep going. Sid, what's up with your CPL radio podcast? It's quickly become one of my favorite shows online, and I've been itching to get new episodes from you guys. Yes, uh, what Sid is referring to here is Cedarburg Public Library in Cedarburg, Wisconsin. Uh, Jeff, who's a, a, a librarian there, is also the producer of Cedarburg Public Library Radio, one of the few public library radio stations in the country, asked me if I would do a Book of the Day podcast slash video with him. 15, 20 minutes about some new book every day, every weekday, Monday through Friday. And... Uh, we we sort of pussyfooted around over the years with other collaborative things. This struck me as gold, and it struck him as gold. And we had a blast, an absolute blast doing this. We made a podcast that was available anywhere that podcasts were. As far as I, I know, it still is. We have a long backlog of episodes that you can listen to. And we also had a YouTube channel that was steadily growing in subscribers and watch time. Uh, so, you know... Sid, you very kindly say that it became one of your favorite shows online, and I can testify, the numbers don't lie, that you had plenty of company. And the library director for the Cedarburg Public Library canceled that show. She told my producer, you can't do this anymore. She did not give a reason. He's her employer. He's, a, he's her employee. So he had no way to argue. So the show is over. And if you liked the show, and you obviously did, because the numbers were really good and getting better, we were closing in on a 1,000 subscribers, I was going to treat that channel completely differently. Jeff and I had already agreed we were going to treat it completely differently than I treat this channel. We were going to monetize it so that we could generate money for the friends of the Cedarburg Public Library, who are the group that put on the show. Uh, it was going to be, in other words, a completely viable program for the library, far more viable, I might add, than any other program that the library has. So you weren't alone in liking that show. And if you don't like the fact that Cedarburg Public Library's director canceled it, feel free to send her an email and tell her that. I don't think it will do any good. I don't think it would also have any long-term practical effect, because how on earth could I trust that she wouldn't change her mind again? And it's the definition of wasted work to do this, to pour in that energy. Jeff and I poured a lot of energy into that show. I think it showed. We also had a blast riffing off each other. I think that's the reason those people came back, because it was so much fun to watch these two guys crack each other up. It got canceled by one person. That's the answer to your question. Uh, let's see here. Aiden says, uh, Aiden says, number one, did you like The Whale? I'm assuming you're referring to the Brandon Fraser movie. Uh, and no, I didn't like The Whale. Uh, I, there were moments that were so heavily emotionally gerrymandered that they couldn't fail to work, even on me. But I think you can guess what I thought about most of the narrative gimmickry of the movie. It's, it's what Hollywood has become. Hollywood cannot tell a subtle story anymore. They have to tell stories like this. I was halfway through the movie. As long as you don't know, Brendan Fraser just won an Oscar for this movie in which he plays a morbidly obese man who teaches English classes online, but he, does, he doesn't have his monitor on because he doesn't want his students to see what he looks like. And he has complicated family relationships that are, that are you know, needlessly complicated by the movie. It makes a, a carnival show out of morbid obesity, which is you know, objection, an, an objection over to the side. But I wasn't halfway through the movie. Halfway through the movie. That's a, long, a lot of movies still to go. At the halfway point of my first viewing of that movie, I said out loud exactly what was going to happen in terms of that online class. I said out loud, he's going to do X, and then he's going to do Y. Very specific things. I'm not going to say them. I don't want to spoil the movie if you haven't seen it. But I said out loud, he's going to do X, 
and then he's going to do Y. And he did that because there's nothing else he could do. It's such an obvious ham-handed movie. It was, yeah, it was so obviously designed to do exactly what it did to get Brandon Fraser a comeback Oscar. So no, I didn't like it. No, I didn't like it. There were some good performances in it, but that can be true of a lot of movies that I didn't like. So uh, number two, uh, do you think that it's productive or healthy practice to rewrite stories? Lately, I've been so frustrated with so many stories that I end up just rejecting a lot of the choices and I basically fanfic it in my head to be the story that I want it to be. My most recent example is the Disney movie Frozen. I just watched Elsa, I just want, wished Elsa and Anna could have been happy kids playing their ice games instead of tragedy striking. Okay, well, I, I, if I understand the question correctly, then you're asking two different things here. You're, or rather, your question progresses from one act, which is perfectly normal and perfectly healthy, to, one, uh, to another act that isn't perfectly healthy at all. <clears throat> rewriting stories that are ineptly done, like, for instance, The Whale. <laughs> In my head, I was rewriting it while I was watching it. I've been rewriting it since. There's a way to make an intelligent movie out of The Whale. It very much not is not an intelligent movie now. It's just ham-handedly manipulative. Uh, but there's a way to do that. There are, there are dramatic choices that you could make throughout that would trust the intelligence of the viewer instead of fatally under, undercutting the intelligence of the viewer like it does on every turn. But uh, Frozen, Elsa and Anna, you wouldn't want to rewrite that story so the tragedy doesn't strike. Tragedy is the story. Tragedy is the impetus for the story. I hope you're not saying that the, the if the urge that you're talking about is the urge to make every story come out nice, well then no. <laughs> no, that's not, that's the 21st century talking, uh, where where all fiction is triumphal and there are no setbacks except to evil white people. That is that is not healthy at all. No, the, the story of Frozen is well done. It's extremely well constructed and it needs that tragedy in order to be so. So no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change that. Uh, how are we doing for time? All right, we're fine. Let's keep going. Alan Black. Hi, Steve. I love a good standalone fantasy novel and just finished Loot in the Mist. I loved it. I am trying to make my way through the fantasy masterwork series. Can you recommend another novel like Loot in the Mist? Uh, well, I don't know what you mean by like. I don't know what element you're referring to there, but uh, you could not do worse than the fantasy masterwork series. Just keep working your way through it. You're going to hit a lot. They did a lot. They picked a lot of really good things. So if you if you stick to that, you'll be okay. You'll hit, I don't know about like Loot in the Mist, but you'll find books every bit as good on that list. That's a really strong list. Uh, Ken Yacht. Greetings, Steve. I am new to your channel and BookTube in general. <laughs> Welcome. 6,000 videos. Oh, goodness gracious. Just keep in mind, most of BookTube is normal. <laughs> uh, and really enjoy it. What is your opinion of John Irving's work? Uh, he's one of my favorite authors, yet I never hear him talked about. Any idea why? He's not read anymore. That's why. Uh, the World According to Garp was the first adult novel I read as a teenager. I'm now 55. Oh, that is fantastic. That is fantastic. I, I have a million questions for you personally about that. That is, fo that is so good. Uh, and I find it still resonates and affects me deeply when I reread it. Well, okay, there, as a 55-year-old, you're in a bit of a minority as far as my experience goes. I don't know many people your age who read it around the time you did who consider that it holds up well to reread it. That's great to hear. It's great to hear that it does for you. I think some Irving does hold up to well to rereading. Uh, I have many opinions on this author, and they go back a long way, and most of them are not literary. So I'm not in a good position. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not in a good position to talk about John Irving. When John Irving was a young man between the ages of 18 and 25, he was beautiful. And he had a lot of talent. And he still does. Oh, I'm going to make a mess of this. I'm going to make a mess of this. Uh, around, around the time of a prayer for Oemini, I believe he got lost in histrionics. That's a very dangerous thing for an author to do. It can only happen when they have dropped from their lives certain caustic Socratic figures who may have scolded them for not doing that. Uh, and I think it led to a downfall of his work. I think it, I think it led to, I mean, the, this, this latest huge book that he wrote is, I think, a perfect example of, of an author whose talent has deserted him. Uh, definitely not true for The World According to Garb I, or The Hotel New Hampshire. I, I, 
I'm not going to be able to do this question justice. I, I have, I have a long and complicated history with this author, so it's probably it's probably not a subject I should expound upon. I'm very happy to hear though uh, that you revisited this work and it held up. That's great because that I have that has not been usually the case for me. Oh, <laughs> I, can't, I did that very poorly. Let's just move on. Oh, uh, Francisco, uh, hi Steve. You'll get to 15k subscribers and much more videos. I hope. Love Q and A. No question from Francisco. Just a curse, because <laughs> I don't want to get to 15K subscribers. Uh, Constantino666. Okay, this is unlikely, but any chance of doing a Silmarillion chapter-by-chapter chapter read-along with delightful rants about the rings of power here and there, that would be fun. <laughs> well, a Silmarillion read-through read chapter-by-chapter, like I'm doing with Lord of the Rings, is definitely possible. Uh, but if you're, if you're in the market for Rings of Power rants, you're going to get them long before that because the Lord of the Rings, the appendices of the Lord of the Rings, are the material that the, the two inexperienced, idiotic showrunners had to draw on for the Rings of Power. That's what they had to use. They didn't have the Silmarillion. They couldn't use it. And they couldn't use the main body of Lord of the Rings with only minor exceptions uh, agreed upon ahead of time by the Tolkien estate. So... If I'm going chapter by chapter, segment by segment through the Lord of the Rings, and I get to the appendices, which is only two chapters away from where I am right now, if I do the appendices, <laughs> free <to> yoga. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, goodness! <laughs> uh, if I do the appendices, that's where the Rings of Power rants will happen, uh, because the appendices are absolutely full of the stories that these two idiots could have told if they weren't being Twitter bigoted. But that was their whole point, was to be Twitter bigoted. Uh, let's see here. David Alvarez Costas. Hi, Steve. Thanks a lot for the recommendations. You've discovered me, William Hazlitt, and Boswell, among others. <laughs> what are the seven deadly sins of autofiction, and what are some examples of good autofiction books? What makes an autofiction book good? Uh, well, seven deadly sins of autofiction is a video. I should do a video of that. I, I don't, I'm not going to be able to, I, I don't need to think about that. I can't reel them off right now. But uh, in terms of good autofiction, uh, some examples come to mind. Uh, Frank Conroy, for instance, uh, as long as we're in John Irving territory. Oh my God. Okay, can I, I'd like to talk about authors who are complete strangers to me. That would be great. Maybe they are coming up. Uh, Frank Conroy wrote a book called Stop Time. Uh, it's a memoir, but it's written in, with all of the artifices of fiction, and it is brilliant. But he also wrote a book called Body and Soul, which is a novel. And it is autofiction. There's a huge amount of autofiction in there. So it can be done. It can be done well. But uh, you say what makes autofiction book good be the skill of the author. And the problem with autofiction is that because it's drawn from your Facebook account, you think you don't need skill. This really happens. So I will, uh, you know, what more do I need to do? <laughs> that is absolutely not true. Uh, but that is what all, all practitioners of autofiction these days think. They think, well, this really happened. So it must already be good. Because I'm, I've got main characters, main character syndrome, wholesale main character syndrome. So of course it must be good. Um, I'll do, I'll do a video on the seven deadly sins of autofiction. That's a good idea. Uh, also, what is the best world history of religion slash mysticism that I can actually find in a bookstore? Oh my, I couldn't rattle them off, and I wouldn't know what's currently in a bookstore. Boston doesn't have any retail bookstores, so I, or there's one that I haven't been to, but the the big one that I had access to is not here anymore. Uh, I don't know. Off the top of my head, I don't know. I've read a lot of them, but I need, again, these are questions that I'm, I'm not going to be able to do off the top of my head. Uh, et cetera. War and Peace is one of my favorite books, which happens to be relatively early work of Tolstoy. My question is, don't you agree that Tolstoy's works become worse the later you go in time in a sense that he starts moralizing more and more towards the end of his life? Especially post-death of Ivan Ilyich, do you think that in the case of Tolstoy, this works to his advantage, and so, and if so, why? Well, finally, a Tolstoy question that I can answer, instead of somebody saying, what do you think of Tolstoy? <laughs> I agree completely. His work gets more tedious and more tendentious uh, the, the later in life it goes. I, I know that there are some people who, who spot that trend and still hold out a couple of works as exceptions that are later on. I find the later on you go, especially old man Tolstoy, it's almost unbearable. Uh, so I, I would agree completely. Uh, Kidus, K-I-D-U-S, among Byron Keats and Shelley, who do you wish lived longer to produce more works? Well, personally, I wish it were Byron. Uh, but 
if if I if I could only pick one, and if I were you know doing this for the good of the Republic of Letters, I would say Keats. Absolutely, Keats. I, I give. I would let Keats live to sixty, uh, and see what comes out. I think I, I've heard it said. I've heard it written many times before that Keats was a talent on the level of Shakespeare, and the only reason that we don't have big gigantic canonical volumes is because he didn't live. He, he, he died before Shakespeare had written a word. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to say Keats for, objectively speaking, and then personally speaking, Lord Byron. Uh, then R. Mac 22 hi, Steve. Which Norse saga would you recommend for someone who has never read one but is interested in the genre? Uh, I would recommend a short one. A lot of them are really, really short. It doesn't really matter which one. But find a, a Penguin classic or an Oxford World classic or something really short. To, to ease your way into, it's not so much the sagas as it is the world of the sagas, the way they see the world and the way the way that you read it, and that's a lot of that's going to depend on the translator and also on all of the annotations and notes. So find a short one and ease your way into that world. Um, what's the matter, baby? What you doing? Huh? Where's the baby? Oh, you seem confused, Frida. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, uh, Indy ATMN, congrats on 6K and thanks for all the videos. Question, can you recommend a book that details or at least captures exactly how and when Victorian era laws began to change to allow women some independence, specifically the aristocratic types, if they were not suffragettes, but merely beneficiaries of change in property rights laws? I'm very curious to know what that looked like for women in 1910, for example. All right. I'd be curious to know uh, about women from the lower classes as well, but I'm more curious about what it was like in terms of being able to own property, even if you weren't married. I wonder what kind of early 20th century laws would have allowed the earliest women to live independently of men if she chose without fear of a man, like an older brother, might withdraw whatever money slash home slash estate he was providing. The book can be fiction or nonfiction as long as it's accurate. Well, Obviously, this this isn't going to work for Q and A because you're looking for one particular book, or at most two books. You're, so I, my 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 proximate advice would be to scour the bibliography of some general book on this subject in order to find very. You're looking for very specific subjects. This is the kind of book recommendation question that's better for an email than for a Q and A. Uh, and there, there are way too many restrictions here for me to make a general recommendation. You're looking for two books, and I don't know what they are, so I, I, I probably read them. We could certainly email about it, but I, it's not, I'm not going to work for a Q&A. Uh, Chris Bianchi says, uh, Hi, Steve, congrats. Who's your favorite Irish author? Uh, probably pound for pound, Frank O'Connor. Uh, what was the toughest country for you to navigate through in your travels? Um, probably uh, the Soviet era, the Soviet Union, Russia in the Soviet Union was probably in terms of navigating. Or no, actually, it would be North Korea. North Korea was a particular challenge to navigate around, not inside, but in and out of. I, I mentioned before on this channel that in my travels, I was never a big fan of borders and border crossings. They're they're dangerous places. They are places where. Uh, illegality and bored violence just collect like crash in a, in a rain gutter. I tried my best to avoid them, and in North Korea, that is virtually impossible. So, I, yeah, probably North Korea now that I think about it. Uh, let's see here. Do you like beards on men? Uh, beards on young men are ridiculous. Any kind of elaborate facial hair, any kind of facial hair at all on young men are, is ridiculous. <laughs> just a, a ridiculous affectation. It's now universal. Whole shaving companies have gone out of business because beards are so universal now. But they are ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. If you're older, then there's there's some sort of aesthetic appeal. But young men, elaborate mustaches, handlebars, Fu Manchus, huge beards that come down to here. No. no. Uh, uh, do you think modern dating is dying with online dating apps? No. No, not at all. Why? No. Online dating apps are, if anything, a godsend. They allow people to far more fine-tune whether or not there's any chance of compatibility with the other person. Whereas a normal, so-called normal, 20th century pre-internet dating techniques very much don't allow that at all. They allow a person to, to, they allow for a lot more disastrous dates than online dating does. 
So, so no, no, not at all. Dying. No. Revived, if anything. Uh, and finally, what publisher do you think publishes the best nonfiction books overall? Uh, non-academic, for me, would be W.W. W. Norton and the Liverite imprint of W.W. W. Norton. And then academic would probably be Harvard University Press. Uh, Robert Wright says, congrats on 6K videos, Mr. Steve. Looks like Henry Cavill is out as Superman. Who would you cast in the role for the next movie? Uh, well, who I would cast is immaterial, right? It'll be it'll be Timothy Chalamet, right? That's, it'll certainly be Timothy Chalamet. So who cares <laughs> what I would do? <laughs> oh, but wait, we're, we're over time here. Let's go on to part two.